Throughout the scriptures, the Lord and his prophets teach about covenants, the ability for us to bind ourselves to God through the power of the priesthood. Sometimes, though, we forget that we are also bound to each other in covenant relationship. Indeed, we are not only bound to God, but when we are bound to God, we are bound to all of his creation. We'll discuss covenants and much, much more in this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm a public communication specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Hill is a research fellow at the Maxwell Institute. And each week, we discuss the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we are once again joined by our colleague, Dr. Jennifer Lane, Neil A. Maxwell Research Associate at the Maxwell Institute. Jennifer is Professor Emerita of Religious Education at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, where she also served as Dean of Religious Education and Associate Academic Vice President for Curriculum. She has published extensively on the scriptures and is the author of the recent book, Finding Christ in the Covenant Path, Ancient Insights for the Modern World, published in 2020 by BYU's Religious Studies Center. Welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all ours. And we are going to be discussing Hosea and Joel today, as I said at the top. And something that somewhat surprised me in rereading this section was the relationship between Hosea and his wife. How might we think about their relationship? That's a great question. And that's often where people maybe get stopped, that it's just so odd. What am I to make of this book of scripture? Because we have a prophet who's told essentially to go marry a harlot, a prostitute, and then their life, their children, her leaving, coming back. Like, what is going on? This is very, very strange. And so just, did this really happen? Those kind of questions sometimes people obsess over a little bit. And I think we can lower the barriers to getting into this text by not worrying so much about what actually happened, because there's no consensus. Even among Latter-day Saint scholars reading this text, there's no consensus. Is what is described in scripture here actually word for word what happened? So there are some people who think, yes, this is historical reality. The prophet, for, for purposes of, of helping Israel understand how covenants work and how the potential to reconcile, no matter how far away we go from him, that he was asked to marry a prostitute and that his wife did leave him and then come back again. And so that's one way of reading it. There's a sort of a middle ground where some of it may be there and some of it might be kind of a literary device. And then others look at it and say, this is just a way of thinking about, is a story to help us understand. But it really, the thing, the thing that matters is the way it's told is supposed to really speak to us on a very personal level. So we hear these stories and it feels like this is someone I know that I care about. And this is something they're going through. And so I feel it deeply. And I think that even though we can maybe bracket the exact historical reality, but experience of feeling somebody's pain, somebody's loss, I think that's supposed to be there. And so we don't want to, to separate ourselves from that. While at the same time, while we want it to feel personal and literal, the deepest reality is the question of how are we reconciled? What does betrayal look like? And then how, what is God's plan in bringing us back to him because of betrayal? really matters here is sort of his covenant people, what do we do to leave him? And then how does he have a plan to bring us back? Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. So also in noticing the names, how are they working in Hosea? Are they symbolic or are there other things that we should understand? Great. And this is an, another thing where sort of in the history of this time period, names had meaning. We talk about the name of his wife, Gomer, the name of three children they had together. They can very well be real people with real names, but at the same time, what's significant is the meaning of the name. And so the sense of whether these were the names these actual family members had or not isn't so much the point as what is being taught through the name. So we start with, just in chapter one, the very beginning of the story in, in verse three, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblim, and then she has a child. And so that starting with Gomer, the name itself means complete. But this, as a story you can see, can go both ways. So complete is very positive. It can have the sense of perfection, but it can also be very negative. So the sense of done, finished, like I am done with you, our relationship is over. 
So there's a kind of, and I think that he just starts out with that sense that's embedded in human agency that we can go either way and the choices we make, but it's not necessarily, even though the choices we make may separate us, the part of the beauty of this and power of the story is that our choices are not irreconcilably separated. So how about Jezreel? Yeah. So then we have three children. So if we work through these verses, we have the marriage to Gomer, and then you have the first child is Jezreel. And so in verse four, this is sort of child being named Jezreel foreshadowing what's going to happen to the children of Israel so that they will be, the word means sow or scatter. In this sense, it's being used negatively, but there are other places later on we'll see where sowing is a positive thing, but here it also has a sense of scattering. And then in verse six, we have another child, a daughter, and the name, and this is it's very clear, it's not just something that the prophet's coming up with, this, this is a name that's saying something, sort of communicating through this child, through this child's name, to the house of Israel, call her name Lo Ruhamah, which, as the text goes on to say, I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. So that's literally what the name means, no mercy. So the first child's name is Scatter. The second child's name is No Mercy. And then we get to verse nine. So third child comes along, call his name Lo Ami. And then the explanation for you, ye are not my people and I will not be your God. So there's, these names are very ominous. The bad, bad things are happening because of what has happened. So there's sort of this warning of loss, of separation, of scattering. I kind of imagine Hosea introducing himself at synagogue. It reminds me of when Latter-day Saints call their children Nephi or something. It's, there's a story that goes with the name. You've got a name that you then have to explain, and that explanation in some sense is a testimony. It's really a kind of a powerful, because it's something so kind of personal to an individual. Your name is also this kind of witness, in, and when it's given by God, it's really kind of, it's really interesting and sort of arresting, which I think is the purpose, because our names are so personal to us. We kind of think of this name as then being, yeah, this, their identity as a, as a witness of what God is going to be to his people. And, and that, I think, really does help us understand how that personal sense of not just telling the prophet, go tell the people, they're going to be scattered, go tell the people, he has the names are associated with children. It's almost a sense of, okay, this is what you're reaping. Like, this is the fruit of a life that, as a people, you've brought forth. And this is what, in this case, they're Hosea's children. <laughs> so, just a, even like he's part of the sense of we are all, we've separated ourselves and bad things are happening. But the good news is it, it's not all bad news. Mostly, I'm just imagining these poor kids showing up to ancient Israelite soccer practice and having to uh, share their names with everyone. But even in thinking about children, it reminds me of the Abrahamic promise that Abraham's lineage would be as great as the sands of the sea or stars of the sky. But it seems to be like the foil to the Abrahamic covenant. Is that intentional on the author's part? I think so. And that's really, you see it very closely from going from verse 9 to verse 10. So as soon as the sense of you're not my people, I will not be your God, which is a reversal of what the covenant relationship is that we see a glimpse of this isn't permanent. And we see that in verse 10, where you have the yet, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And so there's this sense of the sort of hearkening back to the Abrahamic covenant, to the promise that there will be a restoration, there will be a regathering and a reversal. So despite having separated themselves individually and collectively from God, there's going to be renewal, reconciliation, and becoming God's children. And that is, I think, is hopeful when you have such a sobering text. And again, we go back to verse 10. It is so beautiful where this, again, the reversal is very explicit, that it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, which was just the previous verse, it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. So that it's not just restoration, but that it's even, it's heightened, that there's a sense of not just being the people of God, but I think this is an even more exalted sense. So that, that having been separated, 
that there's going to be return and a lifting up into an even stronger relationship and an even closer echoing or sort of mirroring the, the image of God in the people of God. Yeah, and that happens with the children, too, of Hosea, right? Yeah, and so you, you see this kind of lived out with them. And so the warning that things are going to be bad, that there's going to be a scattering, but also that it's not going to last. And sometimes this, the promise is, you know, generations hence, but still that I think having a reversal gives hope. And so you see some of that hope in, in this chapter and also continues in, in chapter two. So in sort of the continuation of that is verse 11, so that the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered. So there's the scattering, but there's going to be a gathering. They're going to come together. And it's interesting, it is that play on the, the first son's name, a great shall be the day of Jezreel. So that which is lost, that which is scattered, so we have the scattering of Israel going to be brought back in a great day. And if we look right sort of in chapter one, go to the beginning of chapter two, you have a little bit more of this play on the names, but again, it's a reversal. And I'm, I'm hoping that the poor kids, you know, felt some comfort in this because it's, it's really sobering to have, have names of doom. But, but this is what we see at the beginning of chapter two, where he says, say ye unto to your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama. So that's exact reversal of lo ami and lo ruhama. So, so that the message is, yes, there's consequences, but God's nature is such that, that there's going to be mercy and there's going to be restoration and reconciliation to being their God and they being his people again. And you see, if you flip to the end of chapter two, the exact same pattern again, using those sowing so here, sowing being the, the more positive sense of Jezreel rather than scattering, I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. So there's this, this sense of, yes, it's going to be tough in time. Things will be made right again. You've shown this kind of wonderful way in which the story, this overarching story of kind of scattering and gathering of punishment and redemption of judgment and then mercy being played out in this kind of one very kind of interesting way with these names, I think points also in a wonderful way to how carefully crafted the scriptures are and how they're using this language and using these names and then kind of bringing them back. They're using repetition, they're binding this together and weaving it together in really kind of fascinating ways. We're used to talking about some of this sort of structure in terms of, say, chiasms or parallelism, but this is another way in which language is used so carefully in the scriptures, by especially the Hebrew Bible. And in addition to that carefulness around language, I just think that the narrative that's being shared here is one that is relatable to pretty much everyone, which is that family relationships can be a little bit tough, right? As much as everyone would like to think that it's all perfect family home evenings and sitting on the front bench of sac room meeting together. That's generally not how these relationships work on the ground all the time. So how does this drama speak meaningfully about how Jehovah is speaking to his people through Hosea? I think that, that what you're capturing there, really trying something that can feel very abstract, is having a relationship with God, being made very immediate. And I think that the sense the covenant creating family relationships and, and the immediacy and the challenge of family relationships is something that was felt more deeply and understood more clearly in the ancient world. So in ancient Israel, making a covenant wasn't just seen as a sort of impersonal contract, but it was really understood as creating a new family relationship. So that's why the metaphors of adoption and marriage to understand a relationship with God run throughout the Old Testament because this is just it's very personal and covenant is personal and, and not only understanding covenant as a family relationship, but also there's another concept that is, is widespread in the ancient world and widespread in the Hebrew Bible, but again, just is different than the way we use language today. And that has to do with the verb to know. And so there's a, a scholar who's worked with this language and he, Terence Bretheim, talks about 
how the idea of knowing and knowledge in biblical Hebrew points to being in a relationship, but a relationship when things are working. <laughs> so talk about like a right relationship as opposed to a dysfunctional relationship. So this is a quote from Frentheim. To know God is to be in a right relationship with him, with characteristics of love, trust, respect, and open communication. So a healthy, good relationship. So God himself is the focus, a personal relationship growing out of a living encounter with God. This language likely has its origins in marriage relation is often used as a, as a metaphor for the God-Israel relationship so that the children of Israel, they likely, as we all do, have relationships that were positive and relationships that weren't as good. And so to understand, okay, God wants to have a good relationship. He wants to have this kind of relationship where you say that you live with him and in relation to him in a way that has all the positive characteristics of the best relationships. That's fascinating because it's pointing to a certainly more intimate and certainly more personal, but also it's more than just a cursory knowledge that God exists. It is a way of living. It's a way of interacting. And I wonder if that's part of the problem that God is trying to point out to Israel here, which is to borrow from Isaiah, you're drawing nigh unto me with your lips, but your hearts and actions are far from me. That's exactly what this the language in Hosea is trying to communicate is one thing to know about God. It's another thing to know that there is a God, but knowing God in the sense it's being used in Hosea really does point to living out covenant faithfulness. So being true to God is knowing God. And you see that right at the beginning of chapter four, that there's a couple verses that just is, pops out where we read, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with, so he's like, he's an accusation. He's like, I'm calling you out on this as a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out. Blood touches blood. So the children of Israel are not living up to their covenant promises. They're not being faithful to God, but they're also not treating each other well, which is part of living in a right relationship with God. And so when he talks about God's nature, it, the truth and the mercy, that's the chesed ve'emet, the, the integrity, the loving kindness, the way God is. And so when we're not living the way God lives, we don't really know him. We might know that he's there. We might know about him, but we don't really know him. And so without truth, without mercy, there is no knowledge of God. And so that covenant faithfulness, the way they're treating each other shows they do not know God. They might say, like you say, they might, their, their words might say, even their the external worship. And there's going to be a place where Hosea talks about to really know him is to keep covenants, to walk in his way, and to treat people with, with honesty, with truth, with kindness the way that God works with us. And so this, this creates this, the rupture is a lack. You have a relationship, but you're not living in that relationship, which is why there's an analogy of adultery. You're, you're not living in the relationship. You have the relationship, but you've, you've left it. And verse six, I think in, in chapter four, really highlights that where he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And so that this forgetting the law of God, God's not throwing them out. He's just saying, you've left me. You've left me because of the way you're living, the way you're treating each other, and that, that he's just telling them kind of what's up. This is the reality that you're living right now, and this is why we, we can't be close. You've moved away from me. It feels like these relationships are in themselves transformative. There is sort of intimacy, there's connection, there's sort of learning, but you can't help in a true relationship, it seems, as you're describing it to actually be changed somehow that the sign of the relationship is actually and this is sort of this constant connection between our relationship with god and our relationship with humanity this kind of vertical and horizontal relationship it sounds like what you're saying the strength of your horizontal relationships is a sign of the strength of your vertical relationship and then when one starts to go the other is going to start to go and it, it might start either way they're both going to break down. I think that's a really, really important point because this knowing, this, this ancient sense of what knowing is, is, is all encompassing and that it has to do with a relationship with God. But as you point out very rightly, so it's also the horizontal. If we start to treat other people the way God would not treat them. We really don't know God. Here's another quote from Frentheim where he continues to develop this way that 
the verb to know incorporates everything about human experience and interaction with the world so that the meaning can include sensory knowledge, intellectual knowledge, practical skill, and physical intimacy. So he says, in the broadest sense, this verb yada, to know, means to take various aspects, the world of one's experience into the self. So that there's this relational sense of the resultant relationship with that which is known. So that the knowing is being a, of everything that you're interacting with. And so the fundamentally relational character of knowing against a narrow intellectual sense is, is shown here. And so I think, again, kind of pushing us away from our idea of like, I know that there's a God or I know about God. So I either have information about God as knowing God, or I have a testimony that there is a God as knowing God. And the book of Hosea, I think more than almost any book in scripture is pushing us to a deeper sense of what knowing God is, is has to do with everything that not just our relationship with God, but our lives, our whole lives are part of that knowledge. The way we, the choices we make, the way we treat other people is part of coming to know God. And that that, I think, has, it, it helps us understand the story really well because that, that kind of intimate quality of knowledge that we see in the scriptures and we see biblical language is really helps point to what covenant relationship is supposed to be. It reminds me of Jesus telling those who claim to know him, you didn't know me. I mean, this is sort of drawing deeply on these kind of Old Testament roots of what it really means to know someone and how that you can do kind of wonderful things, it looks like. You can sort of make all kinds of claims, look as though you've had all of these experiences, but that these chapters are sort of pointing beautifully to what it actually means to, to know God and to be able to say, for God ultimately to be able to say to us, yes, you did, you did know me. And I can see it in the way that you lived your life. Absolutely. And that that, I think, is where making this personal, I think the power of having a personal story, because the the story, it can seem rather abstract. You, you see this in chapter 13, where we know that the children of Israel start to worship false gods. And I think this is part of the point you made, Christian, about you can get off track either horizontally or vertically, and that either way starts to change the other. And I think this might be an example where in chapter 13, verse 2, where it talks about their sinning, they're making molten images of their silver idols, according to their own understanding, so that they're, this worshiping other gods is a betrayal of the covenant relationship. And so we see this in this chapter, but that the worst part of it is it's changed, they're changed, and the way they treat each other is different because of that. They're worshiping God, and then they start worshiping gold. And that, that changes the way they see people and changes the way that they treat people. And so calling them out isn't just like, well, stop bowing down to those fake gods and bow down to me. I think God knows what it does to us. It's not like he's feeling slighted, but he's seeing that we're getting twisted and our hearts are being turned and we're turning into something else, something other than his true children who are made in his image. And we start to treat each other like objects when we're not truly worshiping him. This is love. It's really kind of opened my eyes to what God means about being kind of jealous. Reading Isaiah had a sense that this is about fidelity and infidelity. It's about being kind of faithful. But actually, it, it seems to be more about God being concerned about what was happening to us because of our infidelity. It's not simply... Uh, you need to be faithful to me, but look what's happening to you because you're not being faithful to me. There's a sorrow, uh, yeah. I think, that he feels of what we, we turn ourselves into when we turn away from him and we, we lose that kind of intimate personal connection. When we're closer to him, we radiate the love that we feel from him to those around us. And that's, I think, part of why the first commandment's first, and worshiping God, because when we do love God, it helps us to love other people. And because we partly we feel God's love for us, and then we feel God's mercy towards us, and we're more merciful to other people as well. But when we lose that relationship, then everything else is going to get confused and soured in our lives. And is, if, we, if we stick here to chapter 13, we kind of see almost this wistfulness of like, this is where the way we used to be. This is 
the happy memories of when we started our relationship together. And so you see this in, in chapter 13, verse four, and sort of this thinking back. And I think asking them to think back, back when we were in love, back when we were happy together, when you wanted to be my covenant people and have me for your God, when you left Egypt and you were willing to covenant at Sinai. And he, he uses that language here. I am the, the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. So it's this going back to Sinai, going back to the, the creation of the covenant, creation of a relationship with the people of Israel as a whole. This covenant language shows up earlier. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, matriarch, we have covenant between them and Jehovah. And it's because of that covenant where the Lord actually acts to redeem. And we'll see some of that theme of redemption here. But the, the promise that he makes, it shows up several places. Because of the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will redeem Israel and brings them out of bondage. And then as a people, they covenant. And that's what happened in Sinai is a collective covenant with the Lord. But there's this, I think this to me, it's, 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 it's really this feeling of, of loss and longing for the, the intimacy and the feeling of, of love that was there that is now, they've moved away from that. And so I, I think you, you describe it really beautifully, Christian, that he is worried about what's happening to the children of Israel without that closeness. That brings to mind, too, that even with Hosea and his children having these names that portend doom and gloom, the reversal does come that God is anxious for us to turn to him. And do we see that message of redemption explicitly in Hosea? Or is that something that we really need to dig into to see later on? This is a great question because, of course, it's one of the big overarching themes throughout scripture, but it also shows up on a micro level as well as a macro level. And so we know that the Lord told the children of Israel, I'm going to redeem you because of the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that earlier covenant created a relationship. And this is another, here's one more sort of concept from ancient Israel that helps us get more out of scripture. So that there was a family member in, when we use the term redeemer, that it's actually a family term. Better translation is kinsman redeemer. So the oldest male member of a family would have the responsibility if somebody either got captured, became a slave as a prisoner of war, or they had gotten so poor that they'd have to sell themselves or their children into debt slavery, that the kinsman redeemer, the Goel, would have that responsibility to make things right again, to reverse the loss and to, to, to bring back that which had been broken and to, to restore. And so when the Lord says, I'm the redeemer of Israel, it's because of the covenant. He has that family relationship in which he's going to act to redeem to reverse what people, and sometimes it brought upon themselves. And, and we really see that here in Hosea with this beautifully crafted narrative of individuals, but the story of individuals is pointing to this larger message for all of us as his covenant people. So right here you have the Lord saying to, to Hosea in chapter three, the Lord said unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to, this is a really interesting phrase, according to the, the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel. So clearly this is a, a metaphor or a, a representation. Hosea is being asked to go and to buy his wife out of some kind of bondage that she's gotten into. She's at a point where she has, we don't know exactly the details, what she's done, but she's stuck. She can't get herself out. And so in order to buy her out of bondage, the word redeem, both in Hebrew and English, actually literally means to buy out of bondage. And that's what we see happen in verse two. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, for a homer of barley, for half a homer of, of barley. So like there's a literal price. She must have had some kind of debt, slavery or bondage, something that's happened where she's in trouble and that she's being redeemed. That here. Hosea, representing the Lord, is rescuing her and allowing her to come back, to be with him again. And so we have this sort of metaphor for 
it on this micro level for the big picture. What does the Lord as the Redeemer of Israel do when Israel gets itself back into slavery again? I mean, brought Israel out of the slavery of Egypt, redeemed from bondage, but yet bad things are going to happen again. And again, as the kinsman redeemer, the Lord is going to bring back, is going to mend that which is broken, is going to restore that which is lost. Yeah, it makes me think of my five-year-old running at the pool every single time and falling at least once every single time. And every time I may think to myself, kid, just do what I ask you to and you're not going to fall. But nevertheless, always having arms open and wanting to console her in that way. And I think that thinking about covenant, not only in the family relationship that we just spoke about, but really in a much broader sense. And Hosea gets to this in chapter two. Could you share with us what your research shows about this? Yeah, this is really a beautiful and I think a moving image, with just like the story of you and taking care of your daughter, even though like, if you just listen, you wouldn't find yourself in this mess and I wouldn't have to fix things and I wouldn't have to pick you up and bring you back. And and I think the the Lord through the prophet is is speaking to us as his people, speaking to ancient Israel, but also that we can hear his voice today, knowing that the the kind of covenant relationship he wants is one ultimately that will not just between us, but that will have a healing, sort of healing the world dimension to it. And that I that's what I get when I read the beginning. Well, here in verse 18, chapter 2, 18, 19, and 20, the the image of the covenant sort of permeating all creation. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, with the creeping things on the ground. It's like it's like this new creation, making things right again. And I will break the bow and the sword and, and the battle of the earth. And I will make those this millennial imagery and make them to lie down in safety. A beautiful, beautiful language in verse 19. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And then in verse 20, and I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. So the extent to which the Lord wants to, to take all of creation and all of his children back to himself in an embrace and for us to know how much he loves us and he wants he wants his creation, he wants his world, he wants his children to feel that unity, the peace, and that these are promises of what he wants for all of us. And I think when we see knowing in that sense, it actually makes other passages like my scripture mastery, John 17, verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So knowing God that is eternal life. It's a quality of life, that relationship, developing that relationship, wanting to live in that relationship. That's the kind of life that he wants for us and for all his children. And I think just to me, the language in Hosea, that those verses in chapter two, just speak to that, that invitation, that longing that, that the Lord has to, to live with us in peace and love and for us to choose him and to live in in harmony with that. So I think that that there's a different scholar, but I think that he captures something that helps us sort of understand what is this knowing, how is it that knowing God is eternal life? Like, what does that mean? It's clearly not information, and it's certainly more than testimony. It's, it's a way of living in relation to God. And so Shatrov here argues, and I think beautifully illustrates the verb yada, to know, indicates without exception not a merely intellectual knowledge or ignorance, so like you know or you don't know, but a relationship to deity that includes practical behavior. So knowing the Lord is related to serving, believing, seeking, clinging to, calling by names, all of these, these active verbs that relate the, every choice we make to pray, every choice we make to obey, every choice we make to be kind is a choice to know the Lord, to be merciful, to be compassionate because that's who he is, that's how he is. And so we know him as we start to take on the kind of life that he has. And then the flip side, of course, is when the scriptures use the phrase not knowing, that it means that we're, we're turning away. We're choosing not to live. The language Shotov uses is apostasy from him in violation of his demands, that the Lord is inviting us 
to live in his way. And sometimes it takes trust and it takes faith to say, I want to live this way and not the way I want to live. But, but the invitation is to come to know him and that that's, that's a promise of what covenant faithfulness is. Well, that brings to mind something that is really meaningful to me, which is that it's not just the performing of actions that leads us into this intimate relationship, this knowledge, this knowing of God. Because I think all of us can relate to times in our lives when we are going through the motions, we're just trying to survive. We're trying to get through our day or get through our weeks or get through our months. And those circumstances often come outside of our control. And I think that the Lord understands that when we're doing things for the sake of doing them, that that is something, but that there is a richer relationship waiting when we are able to more intentionally focus on our relationship with God too. Yeah, that is the invitation. And I, I mean, this is a passage from Hosea that the Savior used in his mortal ministry where he called out some of his contemporaries for focusing so much on the externals, but not trying to seek that sort of developing the character of God. So the like, feeling is like, it's enough if I check the boxes. But if I check the boxes, I don't have to necessarily change the way I'm thinking or feeling. And and that it's it's fascinating that that he uses Hosea in his discussion with the Pharisees in Matthew 9, but he quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, where the Lord says to, to Israel, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, of course, temple worship, sacrifices are part of the commandments. He's not saying don't like just throw out that. But but clearly what he's prioritizing is the heart and taking on so the divine nature of chesed, of, of this mercy, this loving kindness, that's you can go through the motions all day long but treat other people horribly. And he's like, that, that's not good enough. That's not really knowing God. That what you need to know to know God is to have that quality of compassion, of loving kindness, truly knowing God, not in not going through the motions. Like be like, oh, I can skip it. Because I think it goes back to Christian's original point that God gives us things to do, stay connected with him so that we can feel his mercy and love and radiate it outward. So we say, well, I'm just going to focus on radiating mercy outward. And I don't really need to worry on about maintaining my relationship with God by doing the things he's asked me to do. I think we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. <laughs> yeah. And I think in this way, it's showing that God wants all of us. He's never wanted half-hearted discipleship. In fact, he seems to reserve his most condemnation for those who are lukewarm, those who are having a difficulty in not being able to decide where they are. But again, just want to underscore, as you have, this not only need for reconciliation, but the availability and God's desire for us to reconcile to him that we see in Hosea chapter 10 as well. Absolutely. And I think this is where he, he uses, again, a lot of this imagery, just like a marriage or family is immediate, a part of people's lived experience that we see for people who are basically have you know, agriculture, that they have sowing and reaping is going to be very personal and very meaningful. So he uses that kind of language to kind of help them understand how to build a relationship with him and thereby become the kind of person that can radiate that love and mercy to other people. And we go to Hosea 10, verse 12 and 13 are really important. I'll start with 13 because it, it starts with where things are going wrong, where he says, you plowed wickedness and you reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way and the multitude of mighty men. So living in ways that are contrary to what God we've covenanted to do is he's using these agricultural analogies to help us understand there's going to be consequences. That that when we plow this, when we sow this, what we are going to reap, what we're going to have as the fruit is going to be ultimately sad and unpleasant and the hope is, and this is where he, he wants a relationship, but he also, it's, there's agency and we're, we're, we make choices. And so he's inviting us as part of, of, of this invitation to reconcile in, in verse 12, the, the beautiful language, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. And to me, I love that 
sort of a collaborative relationship image where we're not just doing it alone. Like I'm trying really hard, but no matter how much I try to sow good, if it doesn't rain, it's not going to grow. And and I think the Lord is telling us if we do our part, that he's going to help us. He's going to give us his spirit, which brings greater renewal, sort of when, we, when we're doing what we can, that we're inviting him to participate in that effort to, to be godly people, to be holy people, and that he will come and rain righteousness upon you. And it's interesting that we sometimes we have to start ourselves and as an invitation, just like we pray for help because we trust that help's going to come. And so that trying to be good, trying to do good invites help and it builds reaching out it also is a way of reaching up and inviting him to help us be the kind of people we want to be. So I, I just think that, that this is a very practical, it speaks to me. It speaks to me about the Lord wanting to help me be reconciled, to help me reverse the ways in which I haven't been the person that I wanted to be. It gives me hope that help's going to be there to, to become that person. Thanks so much for helping us think our way through Hosea. Now, Christian, we're also looking at the book of Joel this week. What should we know about the book of Joel before we dive in further? So this is the next of the so-called minor prophets. Not that there's anything uh, minor about them. They just wrote shorter books than the likes of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So the book of Joel is thought to be a late work and a composite work. Uh, the first part, chapters 1, 1 through 2 to 27, describes a desolating crisis and its resolution. Scholars attribute the rest of the book to another author or authors. It seems to come from a different world, the world, as David Peterson notes, of late prophetic or early apocalyptic literature. In this section, he continues, the world of ritual disappears and is replaced by the return of prophecy, cosmic symbolism, conflict with foreign nations, and images of fertility. This latter section also includes more allusions to other biblical texts, again suggesting a late date of composition. So, in reading Joel, it seems like there's a whole lot of bad stuff going on. Do we know what sort of crises that the ancient Israelites were facing in the book that Joel wrote? The crisis described in the first part of the book is a devastating plague of locusts, a plague so devastating that it is likened to a marauding army in chapter 2. And that's my reading, at least. Other scholars consider chapter 2 to be referring to a secondary threat, the actual threat of military incursion. So we have a people who are living in a time in which they have this plague of locusts and perhaps this threat of other kinds of plagues. Such a devastating plague was actually a reasonably unusual occurrence in the Middle East. Evidence from a later period suggests that it was something that might happen less than once a century, these sort of huge plagues that just devastated entire regions. The relative rarity of such a plague explains the opening exhortation that this should be told to children and grandchildren. This is the kind of devastation that should be spoken about for generations. The New Revised Standard Version captures the relentless and total destruction described in chapter 1 verse 4. It says, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hop locust has eaten, and what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. This is just a relentless wave after wave plague that has resulted in complete and utter devastation. Well, so what does the Lord expect ancient Israel to do in their response? The, the initial response to this total destruction is lamentation, a sense of dismay, understandably. However, as the chapter goes on, the prophet calls the people to turn to God naturally. Solemnize a fast, he says. Proclaim an assembly, gather the elders or the inhabitants of the land in the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Well, so do they understand the locust to be a curse sent from God, like a direct consequence of their actions? So God is seen as the cause of the destruction. The cry that the day of the Lord is coming in the opening of the second chapter echoes the sentiment found in the first chapter, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, it shall come like havoc from Shaddai. Yet, unlike other prophetic books that describe a crisis, this book offers no specific cause. This crisis is not a rebuke or a punishment, 
it seems simply to be the cycle of nature. But since God is the God of nature, this catastrophe can only be described as a great and terrible day of the Lord, a day in which the awesome destructive power of nature is unleashed. Still, even in the face of such destruction, prayer is effective in relieving this burden and stemming the destruction. As it says in Joel chapter 2, Then the Lord was roused on behalf of his land and had compassion upon his people. In response to his people, the Lord declared, I will grant you the new grain, the new wine, and the new oil, and you shall have them in abundance. Never more will I let you be a mockery among the nations. So what's more, God promises to help the nation rebuild rapidly. I will repay you for your years that the swarming locust has eaten, the Lord promises, as a witness to them. And goes on, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, that there is no other, and my people should be shamed no more. I really love that phrase that the Lord will repay for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And Janice Johnson made a really lovely graphic that goes with that that you can find on the Maxwell Institute's Instagram page, which is at BYU Maxwell. So after this destruction on terrifying levels, not even say biblical levels, what happens in the remainder of the book? So in the remainder of the book, we transition from a specific environmental catastrophe to an apocalyptic vision concerning those days when God will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. These verses have a messianic and end times ring to them, and are reused in both contexts. The pinnacle of the prophecy is the return of the presence of the Lord to Zion, in Joel 3.21. Peter quotes from Joel 2.28-32 in his sermon in Acts 2 to show how the dispensing of the gifts of the Spirit that Joel prophesies is for being fulfilled in that moment. So, what could Latter-day Saints take away as the overarching takeaways from the book of Joel that we can think about in the big picture? So I think the message of, the, of Joel is twofold. This is at least is what I took away from it. Firstly, disasters will happen. They've happened to us. They're happening now all around us in the world. We're recording this in the summer. We're still confident that there will be disasters whenever you're listening to this. <laughs> because I'm a very warm and fuzzy person. That's why I'm saying that. It's true. The world is a delicate living system with floods and droughts, lean years and fat years. Sometimes these come as punishment for oppressing the poor or turning away from God, but sometimes they also just happen. In both cases, our best response is increased faithfulness and trust. God can lessen the impact of natural disasters, and God can heal the earth if we will just stop doing those things that bring about his wrath or more rapidly return it to its previous state after a natural disaster. The subtle message of Joel is that we have been given a world that is beautiful and abundant, full of all that we need to flourish as a people. And if we're good stewards, taking care of the earth, then even when natural disaster strikes, God will hasten the healing of the earth and we can return to living in his presence. I think that's a beautiful place for us to end today. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media at, at BYU Maxwell on YouTube.